I'm Scott Allen Miller. This is my life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today I want to talk about something that's a little bit difficult, but we're going to keep it pretty upbeat. But I want to talk about some red flags that you need to be looking for when you're looking at uh, services that you may be looking for here in Nicaragua. This is for people who are looking at moving to the country, not people who are already here in most cases. But there's a lot of you who are considering Nicaragua in the future. And there's some things that I think it's important for you to understand about how things work here in Nicaragua that you can be looking out for people trying to manipulate or take advantage of you before you get here and maybe set you up for failure. I just want to help you you avoid some of those things, both in services that are being uh, made available from Nicaragua and as well as comments that happen down in the discussion group. I do try to keep most everything that people say down there, partially because if people say false things, I want to hold them accountable and make sure that people can look up what they've said in the past. And that surprises a lot of people that I want to keep those things there. But I want to give you guys the tools that you need to be able to decipher what is likely true, likely good for you, or likely misinformation. And we're going to do it on a beautiful, super cloudy day with possibly even just a little bit of sprinkles going on here in Leon. We're going to get to that right after the bump. Something that catches a lot of people, especially expats moving to the country here in Nicaragua by surprise is just the general way that Nicaraguans have a tendency to work. And that is that people work almost entirely by word of mouth, by doing business in person and almost entirely in Spanish. The last bit, not too surprising. This causes some consternation for a lot of expats moving into the country or just a lot of people who are researching the country because most of what you want to know is not available online and not in English. and not in a form where it's easy for you to look up. That's frustrating and it's unfortunate, but it is also true in most countries that a lot of the legal requirements for different things, the way that things work are just not public information. But most countries have a larger population and a higher tourism rate, at least of countries that people are looking at moving to. And so there's a lot more information online from many different sources. And it does give you an opportunity to potentially correlate the information from a lot of different places and say, okay, so nine out of 10 people all agree on the exact same information. This one person's an outlier that's probably the person who's wrong and you can you can kind of decipher and there's just a lot more online here in Nicaragua that generally is not the case and we have a kind of epidemic of people providing false information online and I think mostly this comes from a, a vacuum Nicaragua does not get online it is not a thing that we do here there is a lot of use of Facebook and Twitter and tools like that those are used pretty heavily people are living a digital lifestyle here, but traditional websites and especially websites that have security verification. So you know that you're talking to an actual uh, verified business are heavily discouraged for a lot of reasons. There's just not a big infrastructure for that here. There isn't a culture of it uh, and, and digital adaptation here, adoption here, not adaptation, came a bit later during a social media era. And so people are tending to approach technology from a social media perspective and often from a mobile device perspective. And all of these things have a tendency to discourage the use of traditional websites. But traditional websites are the ones that have the really good security mechanisms that are very robust and proven over decades uh, and tie with email and are able to just provide this mechanism that's very important. What you end up in Nicaragua is a challenge because people have a tendency to use WhatsApp numbers and uh, public email addresses that cannot be verified and accounts on things like Facebook where anybody can make an account and claim to be a business. I know of businesses here that have overlapping names and they just pretend to be each other. It's very confusing. Important large businesses here in the country sometimes don't even have their own website. And so there's no way to absolutely be sure that anything you're looking at is actually coming from them unless you speak to them in person and they provide you a link and they're able to verify that a Facebook page or whatever is actually there. So this is a actual serious challenge that Nicaragua has just in general for business and personal stuff. It affects every bit of life. And it's not something that I think is a great situation, but it is something you have to understand and work around if you're going to be researching anything here in Nicaragua. It is a reality and there is a uh, drive. There is a hope for a lot of people, me included. When I Before I moved to Nicaragua, I lived in the United States. You have so much hope that you're going to be able to go online and find good information. You're going to be able to research things from abroad. You're going to be able to just look up websites and get anything that you need to know. And because we hope so much that that is true, and because it is true in so many other places, we have a tendency to 
not realize or not listen to advice that people like I, me, give um, about this kind of thing. And and people will go online and and find resources and be like, this says, this, I, I, this must be true because I found it online. It is raining now, by the way. And uh, so <laughs> this is our first daytime rain of the rainy season live ish on the video. This is kind of fantastic. I'm going to have to move where the camera is, but I'm really excited to have daytime rain. It is much needed. Um, so people have a tendency to go to these websites and often get maybe just outdated information because very few of them are kept up to date. Sometimes they're years out of date because there's literally no one maintaining it. It's just lingering out there. Same thing with Facebook posts and stuff. If it's not a current post, chances are the information's out of date. Things here change quite quickly and often don't get published. So if you're looking for the latest information, let's say about drones. Right now, currently, we all know, I think, that drones are not allowed to be brought into the country. But if you talk to people, you will constantly hear rumors that they are are allowed in and you just have to fill out some paperwork. This is not true. It is not at all the case. I check with all kinds of authorities on this on a regular basis because I really want to be able to bring in a drone and I can't. But there's a lot of misinformation out there because there isn't an official site that simply says there's no drones. There is a law that tells border control that they can't allow drones in and border control has the current status. If you want to find out an official answer, there's no one to really ask except for border control. I can tell you what border control has told me most recently. I can check with a lawyer or some other resource who can contact border control or who knows people who've tried within, say, the last week or two and answer based on that information. But there isn't a central repository of laws that you can just look up and say, here's the current drone status. In some cases, there can be a law book that you can look up. Nicaragua actually has a little bit better ability to do this than the United States does. But but there aren't a lot of resources that accumulate that into meaningful, human-readable form for normal people. So while it kind of exists as a technicality, it doesn't really exist as a usable resource in most cases. And I do know a number of people who um, have had discussions with me and, and are like, oh, your information's wrong or whatever, and they'll pull out a law and show it to me. And in some cases, I have been wrong. Like, that's, that's totally true. But in some cases, they also bring out a law that they aren't understanding, right? They're reading it, and um, it doesn't, the words don't mean what they think it means. They have to translate it from Spanish. It's uh, referring to something else or whatever. It's very difficult when working with those kinds of resources, if you're not a lawyer here in the country, to both know exactly what the law actually means, because sometimes the words don't apply. For example, there is one that talks about residency, but it's not permanent residency. And when we say residency under normal circumstances, we're actually using that word as a proxy for permanent residency, which you do through migración. But residency itself, the short-term residency, is an automatic status that gives you nothing. So it's not something that people talk about because no one's even aware that it's happening. But technically, if you need to know, are you a resident? Yeah, technically, you might be, right, based on this law, but it doesn't affect anything. And when people say they have or don't have residency, they're talking about the visa of long-term residency that you have to go through some effort to get. That It's an aside, but it's a great example of where if you just go read the law and you aren't familiar with the different terms and statuses, it says something that sounds like it's really meaningful, but in fact is useless information, not incorrect, just absolutely positively worthless. It doesn't affect anything. So knowing that doesn't help anybody, except for really unique, weird circumstances that doesn't apply to any of my audience, but just in case, sometimes it's nice to have those tools under your belt. So those things do exist, but you really need a lawyer who's going to know exactly what they mean, know how they apply to you or how they combine with other laws, because laws don't exist generally in a vacuum. And also they know which laws are actually enforced and how they're enforced and which ones are essentially not really laws, because while they might be on the books, it's not really how things work. You're dealing with another country, and yes, it is true that the law here is much more straightforward and concrete than in, say, the United States or any common law country, not to pick on the United States. Common law works in a very different way. And so bringing some people bring a common law mentality to Nicaragua, and then it's very confusing how the laws work. And other people come from countries that have much more formal uh, uh, civil law systems that are technically closer, but they don't necessarily work exactly the same. And that also can bring a, well, I can just look up a law and I can tell you what the case is. And that doesn't always work that way. So there's a combination of things. You have to remember that Nicaragua is a sovereign country which I realize you guys all know, but it doesn't always make it into our, our thought processes that the way that their law works, the way that their courts work, the way that their police work, the way that the border works, the way all these things are unique to Nicaragua. And you can tell when people automatically jump to, and I'm not saying that people are making an incorrect conclusion, just saying that it's very common when something happens in Nicaragua. We had something happen this week and people immediately said, well, how is that affecting Costa Rica or Panama? And those are sovereign countries. There's no 
trigger to make you think that they would do something because Nicaragua did or vice versa. It could happen, of course, but there's no reason to really associate the two. But people do because they think of them a little bit like states or a little bit like the European Union, when in reality they're absolutely independent countries with very little communications between them beyond the necessary uh, and, and absolutely no, we're going to do laws and politics and, and whatever based on what the neighboring countries are doing other than just the general we watch what they do and we learn so that we can all improve seeing what works and doesn't work for other people so those are all things that you kind of have to realize that nicaragua is its own beast this is true for every country it doesn't matter if we're talking about nicaragua costa rica tunisia uh south africa china every country is absolutely unique they may have trends they may have cultural affinity they may have all kinds of things that make them a little bit like somewhere else, but they're eventually their own countries. And you can't just apply some view from another part of the world or different country to that country, Nicaragua in this case, and expect that from the outside, you can simply be deterministic about how things are going to happen. So it's just a thought process. You kind of have to understand that getting to know any country but Nicaragua in this particular case really requires you to be here get to know the processes and just and, and just learn. And I'm doing my best to bring a view of that to you guys as much as possible, but it's difficult to really convey all those things. And there's things I don't know. There's many times I have to use a lawyer, I have to use an accountant, I have to use advisors. That's just part of the system, right? And even with those things, sometimes we're finding out things together because we're doing something that people don't do very often or things change. And that's a big thing. Of course, anywhere things change, right? Every law has to start on some day. But here in Nicaragua, you're going to find that the law changes much more rapidly. It's a small country, so they don't have the big status quo, like momentum problems that a really large country, say a China has. China, if they want to change major public policy, that requires a lot of moving parts and a lot of people and a lot of approvals and paperwork and whatever just to turn the Titanic around. But if you're here in Nicaragua and you want to make a change to a simple law, chances are it can be made in a number of hours as long as the right people are involved and the paperwork moves through the system very quickly. When major changes came down last year uh, for border control changes, those contact information went straight to border control. They had a email list that contacted all of the border control points of entry and told them that the change was effective immediately all at once. They didn't have to go through some huge email chain, wait for all kinds of people to respond or anything like that. They're able to do things very quickly because it's very small. It's like, it's like a city, not like a large country. And so uh, some of those things throw people off that you may have had information from a month ago. And yes, it could still be valid, but you need to be aware that the chances that something will have changed in that amount of time are much higher than you may be used to. And those of us who live here are kind of used to a constant game of everything changes all the time and we always have to stay on top of it. That is stressful in some ways, but it also gives those of us who, for example, do business here, a huge leg up on people who are thinking about entering the market. And so it's one of those things where like any place, if you get the effort put in to get to know a market and learn how to work with it, you generally have this huge advantage where you're in and entrenched and, and you are able to be potentially successful in business because you've gotten through these learning curves that can be very steep. So I want to talk about some really major simple red flags that you guys can be looking for. And I've mentioned some of this, but not in such a generic context. When you're abroad, or I guess even if you're in Nicaragua, but this is especially applicable to those of you who have not come yet or not spent very much time and are starting to want to put together some resources. So one of the things is there's a tendency for expats or future expats, expats to be potential expats, to jump the gun on a lot of things. You want to reach out to real estate agents, you want to reach out to lawyers, to immigration, you want to start looking at residency. There's all these things, and we talk about this a lot. One of the most important things that you can have going anywhere, but especially to Nicaragua, is patience. Trying to get ahead of the game and do things out of order will land you in hot water. Maybe not a terrible situation where you've done something illegal, not like that, but you may be spending way too much money or being getting misleading information or being put in a position where something's going to go wrong far in the future. You are setting yourself up for being taken advantage of. That is very common. And what happens is from abroad, you cannot look up services in Nicaragua. You can't do that. That is not an option. I wish it was. I truly do. But it is not under the current state. You cannot reliably or even with any reasonable possibility find good, honest services being provided from Nicaragua from abroad. It just isn't possible. And there's a couple things you need to be looking for, a few things. One is 
websites. General, real Nicaraguan businesses are unlikely to have a website. That's just not something that they're going to do. It's not wrong, it's good if they do that, but be aware that that is not an expected mode of behavior. So if you find someone who has a website, while that alone should not count against them, be aware that chances are they're making a point of trying to gab, uh, grab your attention we, before you've done your due diligence. They want to get you before you're in country and realize what things should cost, what things are obvious and what things are obviously untrue, um, how things should work. There's a bunch of things they want to get you while they still have control of a greenfield mind space and they can manipulate you. Right now, maybe they're just manipulating you to get extra business. Maybe they're just trying to get their prices up, but they're trying to grab you at a point where they shouldn't be trying to grab you. A real estate agent who's doing their job for you would tell you that they shouldn't engage with you at that time. A lawyer who's trying to look out for you should tell you that you shouldn't be engaged with a lawyer yet. You should be coming down, doing your due diligence, learning what you need to learn, and then starting to verify which lawyers make sense once you have the resources to do so well. Same thing with accountants or anything else. You need to be here to get good deals and to know what a good deal is. You do not know what is good, what is bad, what is known, what it isn't. Because remember, this is a small market. Everything's word of mouth if you're not here. That's just a requirement to do things well here in the country. The next red flag is services in English. Very, very few professionals here in the country are going to do any amount of business in English, mostly because if they do speak English really well, they can make quite a bit of money doing something other than those services. English simply makes a lot of money here in country. And so you generally don't want professionals, especially in the real estate, legal, accounting space, who have a great deal of English, and especially not those who are going out and using English as a way to obtain customers remotely, when it's not word of mouth, when they haven't been verified. Not that good professional people will never speak English, of course, they might, but that is not the expectation. That is very, very unusual, and it will imply that they have so much money to be made by taking advantage of you that it is extremely unlikely that they would have that set of experience, that they would have the whatever, real estate license, legal degree, whatever, and have good enough English to use it in that way and then decide to not take advantage of that situation because so much money exists in the space of taking advantage of expats before they do their due diligence that it's nearly inconceivable for someone to altruist altruistically avoid doing so when it's just handed to them. So basically, you're putting yourself in a situation where reasonably it's just not going to go well. They have way too much ability to manipulate you. And I know that you're all like, but I don't speak Spanish. I'm really scared of dealing with people in Spanish. It feels like I'm gonna get things wrong and, and everything's gonna go poorly because it's in Spanish. I need someone who speaks English. That's, I get why that feels that way. And you have a good point the millions of you who think that, because you're right, that does put you at a disadvantage. Learning Spanish would help, but having a professional who, who does uh, multilingual work like that in a space that targets expats is just not going to go well. And no matter how much having bilingual from that person seems like it's what you want, it absolutely is not, and it is a massive red flag. Now, if you get into much more professional services, right, you're talking about a CEO of a company, you're talking about someone providing uh, medical care, right, doctors quite often are gonna speak English, that is different. Those are not people who are going out and putting together a package to target expats remotely. If you're here in country and you, and you have professionals and you're getting to them through normal channels and they speak English, that should be just fine. I had to move because there was a bit of rain getting on the camera and while it's a GoPro, it has the media kit on it so it can't get that wet. It can handle a bit of water, but I do have to be a little bit cautious. So I'm getting wet, but the camera is not. Okay, the third thing, and this is, this is really big, is that professional services for expats are not going to be legitimate when they're advertising to you outside the country. And this is a little bit difficult to understand when this is happening because it's hard to tell what it looks like when you're outside of the country, but it's this easy. Professional services for residency, professional services for real estate, any of those things, those are not things that you should ever be looking for from outside the country. I know why it feels like you want to, and there are very specific circumstances where maybe you have to. They should be so incredibly rare that, that none of my audience really has it come up. 
right? Like these are really extremely rare. I know a lot of people have reasons. They say, well, but I want this thing, I want that thing. But yet, we've yet to have, I believe, in these two cases, where that's actually been true. They had a set of circumstances that they thought led them to this, but still didn't actually. So maybe, maybe. There's a reason why you need to do that, but I'm going to caution you that it is not a process that works here, not that works well, and doing so, even if it's something you need, is incredibly risky, and I heavily recommend against it. It is just, there's so much chance of being manipulated or taken advantage of, or at minimum gringo priced, because you went through a process that flags you in every possible sense as not doing your due diligence, as not being in a position to double check on things, as just not having the resources to protect yourself. And once you've done that, yes, in general, Nicaragua is a very safe place. It is a place that you can trust people quite a bit. But when you set yourself up from the beginning to only connect with people who are going through an effort to seek you out based on the fact that you are easily uh, manipulated or easy to take advantage of, those are the people who are going to find you. It doesn't matter how tiny of a subset of the population that is coming from. In any circumstance where you isolate yourself so thoroughly and make it so obvious that you are a good target, the handful of people who will prey on you will find you because that's what they're trying to do. That is what they're looking for. And so you, you put yourself into such a dangerous position that you are very likely to be, even if it's just the most minor thing and you're just losing money or just being misled with misinformation and, and losing time or, or being stressed or getting whatever, that, that process is, is something you want to avoid if at all possible. So those are tools you can use and that alone is going to protect you quite a bit. Once you're here in country, once you've done your due diligence, you've come down, you know that this is the place you want to be, then you're going to be in a position very quickly to get to know people and start to do some reconnaissance as to where you can find uh, resources for finding real estate or how to find a lawyer, how to find an accountant, or how to get good information about starting a business or whatever it is that you need that you thought you needed from abroad. Once you're in country, you can get references for that stuff and start to put together the resources necessary to protect yourself and get those resources. It's not that you don't want a lawyer, of course you do. It's not that you don't wanna buy real estate, probably you do. You just need to do so in a very smart way where you're not setting yourself up for failure. Now, what prompted me to talk about this today specifically? Well, I had a number of comments on the community threads where people were posting some very clear misinformation, but I don't know and I worry about how obvious it is to those of you who are reading the threads when something is blatantly marketing or misinformation that could not reasonably be true because people get very adamant about it and they have often armies of bots or in this case, just a handful, but multiple people who come on or one person with multiple accounts who come on and post the same misinformation or supporting misinformation to make it sound like there's a large group of people with some information that they don't really have. So we had multiple posts that came in and said that the information I was providing this week was false, but they didn't have any firsthand information as to why it was false. They didn't have any source whatsoever. The claim by one person was that they had a lawyer who said the information was false. And this is interesting because my information had come directly from the government, directly. Right? And not just from someone in the government, but from a responsible party who was uh, tasked with enforcing the rule and was the ultimate resource here in Leon for the law. There was no higher person to go to, and there was no less authoritative, no more authoritative person. This was the ultimate authoritative person here. And I also took my lawyer and had them verify everything just to make sure that there was no mis misunderstanding or something we didn't know or everything was very clear and above board. So we have an immigration lawyer and the government authority in question verifying this information, plus many subordinates also verified the information, but of course they are because the director said so as well. So they were, they were obviously not going to contradict the director, but that is the official policy. So we know this to be true. This is definitive. Even if there's not a law that says this is true, this is the actual situation on the ground. Even if they report something else, this is the actual situation from the actual government, and no lawyer anywhere has any right to contradict them. The lawyer could say, oh, there's no such law on the books, and they may or may not be true. They could say, I've never heard of that. Absolutely, maybe they haven't. 
And there's no reason for them to have heard it, because just because the government puts a new rule into effect does not mean that they send out a voicemail to every lawyer in the country and say, hey, we've made this change. Here's how it applies, and this is what you need to know. They don't do that. right? The, law the lawyers find out at the same time as everyone else when someone goes through the process and the a requirement comes up. This is not a law that gets you in trouble. It's just a thing you had to do. And the lawyer was claiming, let me repeat, the person was claiming that a person claiming to be a lawyer said this was false. We don't know that that person's a lawyer or that they actually said this. I bet they did because everyone had the same misinformation to try to sell the same person. And we were able to predict it before they named the person because the person they were going to name was a person we have warned people about previously over the last three years that they are well known in the country for being the one person in this field that you never speak to and that they are known for giving misinformation and going after in a predatory manner people who don't do their due diligence and are easily tricked from abroad. So in every possible way, this is a person we have actually warned specifically about many times on the channel and in person and we predicted that this is the person they were going to try to make the sales pitch about, and then they did it. So that we predicted it ahead of time, both by years that there was a problem, and in the moment before they admitted who it was, really gives it all away. So this was not, we were already established, this wasn't a valid resource before they named them. Then the next person posted the same thing, basically, essentially with a tone threatening me that I had to take down the information from the government that I was not allowed to repeat the government's information because his private lawyer, who he declared the best immigration lawyer in the country, said I was incorrect. He didn't explain how that lawyer could possibly know I was in incorrect. He does not have that authority to the best of our knowledge, nor does he necessarily have the access. And we don't actually know he's a lawyer. Probably is, but it certainly has not been proven to me in any way. I have no reason to believe this person making incorrect statements uh, and, and having an army of bots go post for him is actually a lawyer, but we'll give him the benefit of the doubt that he is. If he actually said these things, what authority does he have to say so? He's claiming that the government is wrong and that he's in charge, which I guarantee is not the case. But before we get to that, there's two really important pieces here that anyone reading this should in theory, realize one is that the person claimed this is the best immigration lawyer in the country. So no one can know this. The government doesn't know who the best is. The lawyers don't know who the best is. Certainly no expat who lives here and has worked with a bunch of lawyers has any idea who the best is. And the absolute last person who would know is someone from outside the country who has not actually been here and even know who the immigration lawyers are. They don't even know who the good ones are. They only know who the ones that market to the outside world are. And they picked the one that most expats know is the one you avoid, not the one that you look to for advice. So putting that all together, there couldn't be a less likely to be able to say best immigration lawyer. So we know this is a misleading statement. The purpose here is to be dishonest right from the beginning. So that's established before they even say the information. Then they say that the lawyer said this is false, but that doesn't make sense because they knew that the information I had came from the government and why would a lawyer be treated as an authoritative source? That fundamentally doesn't make sense. Your lawyers have a very important role. I recommend you have a lawyer at all times. I have a lawyer in the United States. I have a lawyer here in Nicaragua. I have multiple lawyers in both places. They're very important parts of your business and your personal life. And especially when you're moving to a new country, the importance of having a lawyer, once you've gotten there, is very high because they just there's so many things that they can do for you and explain for you and have contacts and know who to talk to and how to deal with things. And yes, sometimes you can replace that with someone who isn't a lawyer, but a lawyer tends to be the best person for a lot of those things. So I recommend having a good, trusted, knowledgeable, real lawyer for sure. But at no point would I ever expect that my lawyer has information that the government does not. If the government tells me something, if I get information directly from the government in real time, and my lawyer says, no, that's, that's not right. Well, guess who's authoritative and guess who's just a random person who doesn't actually know, right? Lawyers shouldn't be putting that kind of information out there. They could put out information like, I haven't heard about that yet. I'm not aware of, the, of an update. That's fine because that's true. But saying that they know that what the government has decided and is implemented isn't real is quite a leap. And to just repeat or to have contacted a lawyer in the first place 
shows an intentional desire for misinformation. Someone went to a non-authoritative source who has no reason to have current information, not that they wouldn't, it's fine to ask them, hey, do you know anything about this? Can you shed some light on it? And they said, nope, new to me, fine. But if you, they, went, they didn't go to the government to say, is what the other branch of government say is true? Or did they check with the same person? Is he quoting you correctly? They didn't check with an authoritative source. They intentionally avoided the authoritative source and went to a what is essentially a completely random person that we assume is a citizen. I don't even know if he's a citizen of the country and went to him and asked a question that he has no reason to know. There's a term for this in business. It's called being an ask hole. It's when you just ask people who don't have the authority to answer until you get the answer you want and then sticking with that even though it came from a random person. I have a famous story, famous, I don't know if that's true, of when I worked uh, on Wall Street. We had one guy. He didn't want to work from home for some reason, but we had a task that required it. And we heard him go to the, the department manager and ask, can I come into work and do this? No, no, no. You have to do this from home. It's a requirement. Oh, okay. And then he went to a whole bunch of people who were not his bosses. They were seniors, but not his bosses. And he went from desk to desk throughout the day, not just one right after another. But over a course of about 48 hours, he walked from desk to desk and asked every single person the same question, even though none of them had the authority to allow him to work from the office. And they all explained the same thing, that it was not allowed to work from the office and that the task couldn't be done from the office, there was a technical limitation that made it not possible. In the end, in this particular case, he was never able to get the fake answer that he was hoping for. And so he did what he wanted to do anyway, and was unable to do the task. And everyone reported him and he was fired. But the point was he was just going to go to any random person. Eventually, maybe he even went to a janitor. Maybe he went to a coffee shop down the street and asked the same question. Hey, do, can I just go into the office to do this? And the guy making his coffee said, yeah, probably, I don't know. And he said, good enough and use that as who knows, right? But he was going to anybody he could trying to get an answer. He predetermined what answer he was going to accept and he was going to ask unofficial people until someone at least marginally agreed with him. That's what we had happen here. I had at least two different people by the time I'm making this video, probably more because it's clear someone is paying for marketing to happen here, right? They're trying to advertise a person's name. They're trying to make it a claim that this person is someone that expats should be going to. If you see anything like that in any of my threads, that is who you never talk to ever, right? That is how you watch for this big flashing red flag that tell everyone, if you figure out who those people are, I'm not going to announce their names, but if you see that behavior, run away from those people and never trust anyone who's going to those people because chances are they're not even real, like what we've now learned. And I went to the website of this supposed person and I noticed that they only have four references, all of them incredibly old. One of them is a very fuzzy picture of a guy named John Smith. For those who don't speak English, John Smith is basically a code for fake person. It, it is a real name. There are people who have that name, but you really avoid using it in reviews and things like that because we all use John Smith as a code word for this is a placeholder until we get an actual person. And the little fuzzy picture they have makes it look. And if you search on that name in Nicaragua, the only thing that comes up is this, what looks to be a fake review. There's one, another person who said something that basically said, yes, he's a lawyer and he filed my paperwork. It was not a real review actually saying anything particularly good about the service. One was what appeared to be an actual business, but whether they actually use this lawyer or not, or they just copied someone's logo, who knows? And the only other review they had is a business that raved about them, but if you look them up, is out of business. So they have no actual references, except maybe one hotel very, very far away as reference at all for their business. Everything from their website to the way that people promote them to the things that they say and the reasons that people reach out to them all scream this is completely fake and this is something you should be avoiding even if you don't know Nicaraguan red flags. If you just know business and common sense red flags, this is already a never talk to this person. But if you know Nicaraguan red flags, it takes it up a whole nother level. But I really want to point out that all those people down in the threads who are calling a lawyer, yes, I realize they're not real people. At least one of them made their, their YouTube account just to make this claim. But one of the other ones does have an old YouTube account, but it has absolutely no content on it. 
and it definitely is being used as a sales tool, a marketing tool to try to get the name of someone out there. And they don't care if, the, if it's misinformation or real. The lawyer is not actually putting himself out there, so he's not up for judicial review. He can just disavow the account and say, I don't know, this is, I didn't really say this. They said I said it, but I didn't say it. Where's the proof? And yeah, they'll be protected. So we don't have to worry about that. We don't know if the lawyer is actually involved. I don't know if the lawyer actually exists. I don't even know if the service is real. All I know is they have a website and that they the website's identity is used to try to trick foreigners. That's all I know for sure. But what I know is that the, pro the claimed process of calling a lawyer from abroad to try to get the answer that you've predetermined you want is intentionally lying. The whole thing was set up to create misinformation. And if they got the information that agreed with me, they would just move on to someone else or they would just not repeat it. But if they got someone to either say the thing that they want to hear or they just decided to claim they're going to say that, that's all that's happening. But so that's a tool I want you guys to have when you're looking in those discussions. In this particular case, you have specific tools to look for. But in the more general case, look for people reaching out and referencing in such a way that it looks like marketing. Oh, this would encourage me to go use this service. Oh, I bet this is marketing and not real information. Look for people who are reaching out to someone who's not an authority, right? I understand I'm not an authority, but at least I'm giving you firsthand information from an authority. I spoke to an authority. I'm putting my own uh, reputation on the line, and I, I have disclosed who I spoke to, not by name, but the exact position you could go look them up. Right. I've also verified with a lawyer, but I haven't put their names. So you can't go verify them, but I have. Right. But I'm personally telling you the information and how I got it. I have a source. Oh, and then one of the people said I needed to check my sources, but told me to go to someone else in immigration. Now, what this tells us about that person. Now, this is the account that was just created. So I think this is someone in the United States. Again, I think they're trying to sell this legal service and they're hoping to get to a point where they could post the name and stuff, but we had already guessed who it was. And so it kind of shut them down because we're like, it better not be this person. And they were like, oh, so that curtailed their ability to use it as a sales pitch. But they said we needed to go to someone else in immigration, in migración, to get a different answer. So first of all, they're basically saying, keep asking until someone gets it wrong or is willing to do what you want. So clearly going down that path that we said, but also they said the wrong department. So had they actually talked to the lawyer that they claimed they did or were implying that they did, he should have told them that that was the wrong person and that that was misinformation. If they actually had any information at all about how the processes work here, even casually, things that they definitely can get from people's websites, because this is public information, is that they would have known that this was not immigration that has any say in the matter. They are not the authorities, they are not involved. All immigration does is get the information from the Department uh, of Health. They give it a yes or a no. It's that simple. So this is the Department of Health in trying to get you a yes has certain requirements. And we're not going to dig into that. The point is we went to the Department of Health. We went to the authority within the authority department and verified all the way up the chain at every level with a lawyer involved. But we did so directly and we're told Absolutely, black and white, no question, from the source itself. There is no other source that this is the requirement, period, end of story. Now, you can say that I made it up. Yes, that's valid. You can say that that person is confused and the law as being applied shouldn't be applied that way. That is valid. I don't know how you would get that information. I don't know, no lawyer can have that information. But yes, that is a reasonable argument. But it doesn't change that this is the requirement as being applied currently on the ground. And that's what we're reporting on. This is what the government has come out and said, that is definitive. So you can claim I'm lying, but no one's making that claim. They're trying to claim that we should just ask someone who's not official, someone who has no access to the information in any official capacity, at least. Every, you all have access to this information because I gave it to you and told you who has the authorities. So you have everything you need to source check this if you want. What they're trying to do is convince you to go to random people who have no reason to have the information, but do have a strong incentive to tell you what you want to hear because, let's go back to those earlier red flags, they are trying to manipulate you into wanting to use their service from abroad 
before you have the common sense and the common knowledge to fact check the things that they do and say and claim. And you won't know what is reasonable for price. You won't know what's reasonable for action. You won't know what's reasonable for time frame. You won't know who is well known for being questionably ethical here in the country, who's not to be trusted, who's not to be spoken to if you're trying to get legitimate answers. And instead, they want to grab you and make you trust them before you have adequate tools to evaluate them. And that is where the sales pitch is super strong. And it's a little bit difficult if you're not thinking in those terms to see it happening. But when you live here or are involved, this is what I do for business, right? I do this all the time. This is just social engineering. This is a form of hacking the humans, ways to manipulate you into trusting someone and putting yourself in a, a precarious position to be taken advantage of very easily. And that's what I want to protect you against. All right. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. As always, if you would share on social media, tell friends about the show. This is an important one. So even though I know this isn't a fun topic per se, it's important tools because even if it's not a specific case, because we've talked about a lot of specific cases in the past, real estate, lawyers, whatever. This is a general case. This is a pattern that is followed over and over again. And it is very effective because expats in general, have a general just huge gap of knowledge about how Nicaragua works for obvious reasons and are super used to an environment that works very differently. So it's easy for them to think that it must be like that in some way. And so when people pretend that it is, seems reasonable, have very little access of resources to be able to verify these things. And because they're super hopeful that it will work in a way that they like, when someone gives them that hope, they tend to emotionally latch onto it, and then it's very difficult to give it up. And it's easy to get angry when someone points out that those things may not be true. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you all tomorrow. And if you'd be so kind, take a moment, click on one of the videos that I'm going to do my best to put up on the screen. And that helps to get uh, the algorithm to realize that this is a good show that we should uh, be, be sharing with more people.